last but not least is my good friend Steve, the interventional imager, evolving roles in the heart team. Can I become a surgical imager if you're an interventional? Uh, I'm going to start doing your echoes if you want to do my interventions. That's going to be a tough, tough deal. No, thank you. Not yours. All right. I fully recognize that I am the last uh, scheduled speaker between all of you and lunch. Um, so I once heard it said that the content of the last speaker before the break is like the horns on a steer. There's a point here, and there's a point here, and in between, it's a whole lot of bull. So I'll, <laughs> so I'll try not to give you too much bull, and I don't want you to think about that joke as you enjoy the barbecue lunch. OK. So I'm going to tell you a little about the heart team imager and the sort of the involving role of what that really means. So historically, this is how we kind of got excited at the beginning. We had 3D echo, and we'd look at some interventions, and we'd guide them. And this is sort of a classic mitral stenosis case, uh, rheumatic with commissural fusion shown here, anyway balloon. Post balloon, the commissures are split. The mean gradient falls in half. Uh, we're happy to be there. It all seems successful. We documented something. Didn't really need to be there. Uh, interventionalists do this just fine without us. But it was kind of fun to be involved. Uh, so that's kind of the passive interventional imaging. Um, we sort of did this sort of thing where we had a, a nice echo and we'd find uh, with our technologists a way to sort of bring that into the cath lab and get the images playing and it took a little while to figure out, you know, what is the impact? What are we really doing there? Then came this era, oops, of growth. So we started a valve clinic in 2009 and with Dr. Reardon's help and we do this combined places and lots and lots of places now have these multidisciplinary valve clinics, but the valve world has really exploded with technology and with need and and we've had this you know sort of linear growth every year and we now see over a thousand patients a year just with specialized valve dysfunction and how did this happen this happened because the technologies came along uh, and with catheters you can fix so many structural things and increasingly they all need some guidance so you know what's the short list of things that we get involved in it's the asds and the vsds and the paravalvative repair we sort of started with that la occluders with things like watchman Taver, of course, which still seems kind of uh, avant-garde, and we heard a lot about it today, but now that's, that's stuff, that's so six years ago. Um, <laughs> now we get into mitral repair uh, with mitral clip, and we do now a lot of that. Uh, TMVR, which we've had some early experience with, is just, which is really kind of mind-boggling when you get involved in that procedure. And then now we're into tricuspid repair, um, and it just keeps coming. Uh, and the requirements of the interventional imager keep changing. So this is just an example of sort of uh, you know where we've come. So this is a this is a mitral case, nice and labeled for you here. There's a clear P3 prolapse. You see it on 2D. You see it on 3D. There's this horizontal jet comes right across there. So challenging to quantitate that at baseline. This is a case post mitral clip. So we stuck a mitral clip way over here, not A2 P2 as the initial sort of trials were. This is sort of way over here in the medial part, almost into the commissure with a reduction down to this. And when it's all said and done, you've got some more MR. And now you've got to figure out, is that too much MR? Um, what skills do you bring to bear to make this decision? Are you done clipping? Do you keep clipping? How do you go? But remember the basics. You're an echocardiographer, so you have to look for other stuff. And in this particular case, it was pretty easy. This was the pulmonary vein flow before the procedure, sort of no anti-grade flow, no S-wave. And then this one clip, this acute resurrection of the S-wave. So the pulmonary veins are really all that matters. If they're happy, patient's happy, you're done. Um, so recognizing you've got to bring to bear all the other things you know in these cases. And that's just an example of that. So we just saw a case of mitral clip, mitral clip post procedure. And you've got that you know, crazy color. What do you do with it? And I know Dr. Zogby's chairing the guidelines that we're all working hard. And it's, it's a challenging guideline um, because there's not a lot of data to summarize or opine about. But this is a case. This is one patient who had two mitral clips. At the end of the case, there's one central jet, so maybe we could be fairly confident quantitating that in the procedure. This is uh, three mitral clips with one kind of medially directed eccentric jet, a little more challenging. This one is one clip with two crisscrossing jets. OK, that's getting a little tougher. How do we figure that one out? And this is one mitral clip with five jets. <laughs> so as the guidelines say, we pause it. We stop it, we measure all the vena contractors, we add them all up, no problem. No, so it's, and the other thing, during the case, you put a mitral clip here and the jet just doesn't say, okay, I'm gonna go away. Now there's a, the pressure goes over here. So it's like whack-a-mole. You clip it here and the jet moves over here. 
uh, and then you put a clip here and the jet moves back over here. So it's, uh, it's, it's not easy and that's what we feel like sometimes when you're in these cases. Um, this is the contemporary interventional imager. This is the stuff we, we have to deal with. So here's the ARS question. So we'll do this old school. So the most important role for the imager on the structural heart team is to evaluate PVL after TAVR, option one, to recognize low flow, low gradient, severe AS, to ensure the echo reports contain the data necessary for the complete NCDR, STS, ACC, TVT registry reporting, or just to adjudicate all things, mild versus moderate, EF 45 versus 55, we're done and we all get to go home, or we're not done and we gotta keep staying and do this case. So obviously the answer is all of the above. That's the sort of the stuff that you're responsible for as the imager. So this is an important slide because it sort of emphasizes, you know, a lot of the times that this, this kind of talk gets focused on the image guidance, as that's the primary role. But really, you're doing all this stuff. You're involved in patient selection, procedure selection, sometimes device selection, uh, recognizing, for example, the paradoxical low flow severe AS. That's all about patient selection. You've got to guide the procedure, and that's looking at the safety, the efficacy, and the efficiency of the case. And then after the case, whether it's immediately after or during the hospitalization at the one month, at the 12 month, you've got to see, you know, how is the device functioning? And more importantly, how has the patient responded? Uh, to the device. So all of that entire spectrum is the role of the interventional imager. So you're embedded. You're fully embedded in the structural heart team. Um, that's the concept. And this is, you know, some of the operator characteristics. So who are the people that go into this? And, and what's, you know, wh who, who's drawn to this field? Well, you've got to be brave because there are risks. Uh, this is one of our CRNAs, and this is this Zego thing that spins all around in the hybrid OR. And if you have to know when it's moving and when it's not moving, uh, she wasn't really hurt in this case. So this is an obvious risk, and you have to be a little uncomfortable sometimes in your case. This is the stuff that's important. Um, this is the unseen risks. So the radiation is a big deal. And this little graphic was from a study that we did here. We put these real-time dosimetries on a grid all throughout the room and measured different fluoroscopy angles. Noted that when you're when the uh, II is AP, there's a fairly focused beam, but as soon as you get off of the AP, the radiation field grows enormously. And if you watch this little video play, if ever you're standing where the interventional echo person stands and they go lateral uh, on the radiation, you're getting an enormous dose. So this is the stuff that a lot of us in echo, at least, that training was so long ago, we're not thinking about that, but it's, it's sort of a need to retrain and understand radiation risks. And that's, that's a real part of the uh, procedure. So the recruitment and the funding. Let's talk a little bit about that. The recruitment, I think, is fairly easy. You kind of got to like this stuff. Um, so this is a stenotic bioprosthetic valve. Here's a transeptal. Uh, and this is the delivery of a new valve. And it's just, it's very gratifying to be involved in these fairly quick cases. Um, so that, that the recruitment is kind of fun. But this is the new reality. You're, you're sort of, you're in there. It's, it's one foxhole. Uh, there's the interventionalist and there's the echo. and you know, we had a surgeon who used to come by the echo lab and, and refer to the echo folks as the imaging non-combatants. Um, you're just giving data. Uh, you're not seeing patients. Uh, and this is very different now. You are no longer a non-combatant. You're, you're embedded on the team. Um, some of these slides Dr. Barker showed earlier, but I'm gonna show them from a different perspective. So this is some of our, one of our earlier TMBR patients. So, you know, in sort of patient selection, you've got to be facile and a little familiar with some of the other modalities. Certainly CT is one that we you know as an echo person, we have to learn more and more about. And this is sort of the planning of a TMVR and the, the recognition of the, the perimeter oversizing that's important to get it there. You know, this is one of my favorite things in the case is that you have to, as the echo person, guide the, inter the surgeon typically for their apical poke. So this is, you know, this is the finger and, of the surgeon and, and I'll make it easier for you. <laughs> And, and, you know, it's true. Sometimes our surgeons don't even wear gloves, just like this. <laughs> and, uh, but as an echo person, it's a lot of fun to tell the surgeon where to put their finger. You know, you don't often get to do that. <laughs> and how's my finger? Your finger's no good. You've got to move your finger. That, that's, that's a fun thing to have. Um, so we, we do these apical finger pokes. You've got to get across the right, split, the right spot. And I'm so glad Dr. Reardon is up here with me. So this is, this is Dr. Reardon in action. This is the apical access for a TMBR. This is the little garden hose uh, catheter, and I don't know what this is in French. I think it might not even be some other language. It's so big. Um, but it's a big catheter, and when it goes in and the procedure's over, what happens is this catheter comes out. Of course, it's a beating heart procedure. 
So the way this is set up is the, the table is here and you've got your back to the table and you're providing the echo and everybody can see the echo. And this big catheter comes out in a beating heart. Not the first time, but the first two times. This catheter comes out, you're doing the echo, and there's a spray of blood. And the blood hits the keyboard. So as an echocardiographer, when the blood hits the keyboard, you are embedded. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> So, that doesn't, so now when Dr. Reardon takes out the catheter, he doesn't whip it around anymore and, and make the blood spray. But you feel embedded when, when, when there's blood on the, on the echo machine. Um, so this is what Dr. Barker showed. This is sort of the deployment. The TMBR is coming down. You're landmarking everything against the annulus. you rapid pace. But really what this feels like is you aim, you aim, you aim. Then you have to close your eyes and shoot. Because the device comes down and typically it obliterates all your landmarks. So you go to all this trouble landmarking everything, you bring the device in, it's this huge shadow, uh, and you don't see anything, uh, but you have to make a decision on deploying it. And, and for Randy and Pat, I know you guys are uh, sort of on the, the study, the advisors to the trial, the Apollo trial. And in that trial, the expectation is this device will go transeptal soon, which will then have a very large delivery catheter in the left atrium. And all of these imaging challenges will become even more important uh, when you combine the very large bulkiness of this device with now a bulky delivery system that's all going to be interfering with the echo imaging that's required to guide the implant. So this is sort of the reality of what's happening. Um, we saw this before. This is a sort of the, the very nice function of this device, a, a widely patent LVOT. Uh, you didn't see the color before. There's like three pixels of central uh, MR with no PVL whatsoever. Again, gratifying to be there. One of the interesting things when you bring an imaging perspective into these cases, you look at the other stuff. So this is the CT of the patient ahead of time. You see there's some LV dysfunction. This is what we expect is the case of functional or secondary MR. But let's see if I can find my pointer again here. I'll use the, here it goes. Yeah, yeah, well. <laughs> so look at the annular motion. Now, there's a fair bit of annular motion and just get, get your eyeball on that EF. Now on the right is the same patient post TMVR. And look at how the annulus sort of gets paralyzed. It doesn't move nearly as much. And you have a, a drop in the ventricular function. Now the forward flow goes up because you've taken away the regurgitant jet. But recognizing, and Dr. Lorger is telling us all the important features about the annulus, well, you're, you've paralyzed the annulus by putting a massive device there. So these are sort of the things that we have to recognize and maybe iterate on uh, with this technology. And there's the before and after, which is kind of satisfying. So in the spectrum of interventional echo, we have, you know, this is sort of my own personal bias on the added value of the procedures that we get involved in. I think ASD repair is probably less impactful once you've done a bunch of them. LA occluder, likewise, we don't necessarily always have to be in these cases. But you get into TAVR, it's arguable if depending on the patient risk and if you have a TE required or at least you're ready to put the TE probe in if there's any complication. Valve and valve, yes. But mitroclip, PVL repair, TMVR, tricuspid repair, all of the frontier stuff, uh, you're basically critical and you need to be there. So recruitment is easy if you like the innovation, if you like the challenge, uh, and if you're willing to accept a very steep and sort of humbling learning curve. So the next question in the last section I want to talk about is the funding, funding for this, for this role. So at my institution, the funding for our interventional imaging program is, and this is a question to you in the audience, is the funding resolved since they're paid out of a cath lab or, or an OR budget? Is it resolved since everybody sort of shares it, the role amongst multiple different faculty? Is it resolved since the introduction of an interventional echo fee code several years ago? Or is it an ongoing concern? And I think the answer probably depends on, uh, the, on local politics and, and financial pressures. But we know almost four years ago now, there was the introduction of an interventional echo code uh, so that was very helpful, and it's very appropriate for certain uh, procedures. But if you look specifically, and this is sort of the crux of one of the challenges, of the funding just for the MitraClip. So a regular TE gives you 2.6 RVUs. If you do an interventional TE, it's about 4.5 RVUs. What the interventionalist would bill is about, for two MitraClips, about 40 RVUs. So you're both there, and as Dr. Barker talked about, he's the hands, somebody like me would be the eyes but you've got a tenfold difference in the payments. And one of the problems is most of these procedures are becoming increasingly dependent on the, the real-time echo imaging. So this is one of the big challenges we have. And most of the models to fund this kind of activity look a little like this. So you can have interventional RVUs only. You could have an echo team where you sort of share the pain amongst multiple people. You could have shared billing, uh, which is tough to pull off. 
You can have a different budget here from the OR, or you can have a cath lab budget, and sort of, you have to get creative in trying to pay for this stuff. The reality is all of these are sort of like this. They're all robbing Peter to pay Paul. None of them represent new money. Uh, it's all shifting money between accounts. Um, and that's really one of the challenges with the field is sort of the, the uh, you don't really have the funding models to keeping track of the imaging technology or the requirements of the devices. So finally, you know, what are the, the challenges? The job description I emphasize is really a before, during, and after intervention role. The, uh, the characteristics of the individuals who are interested tend to be cautious, but flexible, and detailed, and as a selective leader, because sometimes you have to speak up in a case, and sometimes you just have to shut up in a case, and eventually you figure out when. Um, the recruitment, I think, is easy. The funding is challenging. Uh, there's lots of models. They shift money. Uh, there isn't direct funding. And the solutions down the road are probably going to be a combination of team payment or payment for quality. And that's really the role of the imager on the team. So that's it. You're fully embedded. You're part of the team. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you.